All right, everybody, welcome back to our course on cybercrime. I'm Kevin Jennings, and this is going to be section 13, all about criminology as applied to cybercrime. And um, for those of you who may not know, criminology is essentially an entire subfield trying to answer the question, why do people commit crime? What is it about people that causes them to be either law-abiding or criminal or drift back and forth, of course? Now, um, I'm going to discuss many different um, criminological theories here in this section, uh, and I'm going to do a very, very, very uh, quick and dirty job of explaining these theories. Um, I don't have time to fully discuss each one, um, but if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you want to know more about criminology and the uh, most... Um, popular theories of why people commit crime, why people become victims, uh, please feel free to check out my criminology course, uh, which is also on this same platform. So, um, we're going to begin again by talking about subcultures. And subcultures are um, kind of little miniature but separate cultures that exist within or underneath larger cultures, right? And they're usually created um, either as a rejection of the main culture or because the, the people involved in that subculture believe that there's some aspect or, or thing or process or um, part of life that the larger culture just isn't valuing enough, right? So these subcultures are kind of characterized by a different belief system, right? Um, different um, values, different beliefs, different priorities, um, even different language, right? Um, and the internet creates these subcultures really, really effectively, creates them really well. So there's going to be subcultures on the internet uh, for digital piracy, and hacking, and um, child porn, and, you know, all these other kind of um, sub topics within the field of cybercrime is going to have their own subculture. And those subcultures are going to kind of reinforce each other and uh, provide justification for their illegal activity. And it becomes kind of an in-group for people outside of the dominant culture where they can get um, support and reinforcement and uh, discuss things with like-minded people and become more attached to that crime or that type of offending. Now, <laughs> learning theory is one of the most popular criminological theories um, in this part of the 21st century. It was originally kind of uh, created by a guy named Sutherland back in the 40s, just after World War II. Uh, and then it was expanded by a guy named Akers. Um, but again, the sh kind of very short, quick and dirty version of learning theory is that, um, uh, you know, as people are reaching kind of the early adolescent years, they start spending less and less time with uh, family and, um, you know, authority figures. And they start spending more and more time with their peers. And if their peers are deviant, uh, those youth are going to learn kind of not just how to commit deviant acts, but the values and beliefs and the kind of ideas behind uh, why deviant acts are the right thing to do, right? So uh, Sutherland called these definitions. Uh, when we see our peer groups doing deviant things, not only do we learn the actual techniques of how to do those deviant things, but we also kind of are subconsciously taught that doing those deviant things is expected or normal or good, right? Um, then, you know, so we either do those deviant things based on imitation, 
uh, you know, where, oh, we see Bob smoking marijuana, so we're going to do it like that. And, oh, he does, you know, so we kind of imitate those around us. Uh, and then when we do those deviant acts, if they're reinforced, if they're kind of, you know, if our peer groups give us praise or uh, benefit or, um, you know, clearly uh, uh, approval for those acts, it's going to then reinforce this idea of, oh, I should be doing deviant things. I uh, received praise and benefit last time I did deviant things, so I'm going to keep doing them. Now, as I said earlier, this is one of the most popular criminological theories in the 21st century. It's uh, received a, a huge amount of research, um, both in the field of cybercrime and just in more kind of general criminal um, uh, activity, you know, more traditional crimes. Um, and it's always found to be incredibly predictive, especially when it comes to cybercrime. Cyber criminals, you know, no matter what kind of sub type of cybercrime you're talking about, whether it's, you know, digital piracy or online bullying or uh, hacking or, you know, any of those other sub types of crime, uh, those who commit those crimes are way, way, way more likely to see that kind of activity by their peer groups. Now, kind of one of the um, caveats to this theory is that there is a little bit of issue with uh, kind of a chicken and the egg problem, right? Is it that people learn from those around them and thus become more deviant? Or is it is this association based on the fact that people who are more likely to be deviant then seek out deviant peers, right? So it's not necessarily that our peers' deviance is causing our deviance, but our deviance is causing us to seek out and find deviant peers. That's the big question. But there is definitely a huge correlation between online cyber deviance and having or being around others who commit the same types of online uh, cyber deviants. <laughs> now, the general theory of crime. This is one of the more modern uh, major theories of crime. And the general theory of crime, again, uh, the very bare bones, very simplistic description of what all, this is all about. Um, this was developed by uh, uh, two researchers named Godfordson and Hershey. Um, and it's a... a a control theory, right? So, um, uh, control theories are focused on um, what uh, culture or outside forces can do or not do to control people and prevent them from doing um, uh, criminal or deviant acts, right? And the general theory of crime focuses very much on self-control. Are you taught self-control at a young age? Did you develop self-control at a young age? Uh, most of us do. Most of us have, you know, decent to high levels of self-control, uh, and that prevents us from committing crimes, right? Um, but if we haven't developed low self-control by a relatively young age, I, I want to say it's if it's not developed by eight, either it's um, very difficult or impossible to, to develop after that. Um, but if we don't have high levels of self-control, uh, we're going to be more um, impulsive, uh, more risk-taking, more um, uh, spontaneous, right? And all of that leads to criminal activity, okay? Um, another issue with self-control or another thing that um, it's kind of highly correlated with is a lack of empathy, which again helps to uh, lead someone into a life of committing crimes, uh, whether cyber or not, right? Um, so this general theory of crime is all about self-control. Uh, when we look at computer crime, uh, we see that a lot of it is kind of seemingly uh, associated with low self-control, being a cyber bully. Um, scamming others, these uh, either based on evidence or just based on, you know, common sense can kind of 
at least be theoretically seen to be associated with low self-control. On the other hand, there are a lot of cyber crimes that involve huge amounts of self-control. They involve tons of patience. They involve tons of discipline. They involve tons of study and knowledge, right? And that would seem to be the opposite of low self-control. You know, do the people who spend months and months trying to break into a, a certain company's computer system, is there any possible way they could be said to have low self-control if they're, you know, focused on this goal and they are disciplined and stubborn and, um, you know, control their urge to essentially do anything else, right? <laughs> so um, whether gen the general theory of crime is kind of applicable to being a cyber offender really kind of depends on whether you see computer crime as simple or complex. If it's simple, then absolutely there is lots of evidence that uh, low self-control is associated with uh, offending behavior. But with more complex crimes, it doesn't really seem to have a lot of self-control here. Now, uh, self-control also has a really high correlation, not just with cybercrime offending, but with cybercrime victimization as well. Those people with low self-control um, are much, much, much more likely to be victims of cybercrime. Now, there's probably a lot of reasons for this, right? Um, you know, just as offenders with low self-control enjoy uh, that, that risk and adrenaline-seeking behavior, so do potential victims with low self-control. And people who enjoy risk, enjoy adrenaline-seeking behaviors, enjoy kind of... Um, you know, doing things without maybe the necessary precautions are definitely going to be more prone to victimization. Um, there's also low self-control can cause frustration, right? And that frustration with anything from, um, you know, uh, uh, not having uh, the financial means to do what I want to do. So I'm going to go out and fall for a uh, get rich quick scheme on the internet or, uh, you know, I'm frustrated with um, having to purchase a, a movie and then walk, watch all the previews and all the stupid stuff at the beginning of the movie. So I'm going to go out and uh, pirate that movie. You know, all those things can cause escalation. Um, and thus that escalation uh, can cause higher rates of victimization. And then of course there's frustration with security devices. You know, uh, if my antivirus software keeps telling me, hey, you shouldn't do that. I'm going to get frustrated with that because I want to do the thing uh, and I'm going to turn my security software off. Um, and then, the, you know, again, I will be much more likely to become a victim of some kind of cyber crime, malware, scams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. So this leads us on to general strain theory. Uh, general strain theory was um, uh, developed by a guy named Agnew. And um, he says that, uh, Becoming a criminal is essentially based on um, four things, right? Uh, the first is a failure to achieve goals. You know, I have some goal in my life, and that's going to be different with everybody. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, an economic goal. Sometimes it's an educational goal. Sometimes it's a social goal or a cultural goal. Um, but if I fail to achieve those or perceive myself to have not achieved those, um, that's going to cause strain. Uh, removal of positive stimuli, i.e. there are things in my life that I really like. You know, my dog, my wife, my really cool car, and my amazing job. If those uh, are taken away from me, either because, you know, my wife leaves me, or my dog dies, or I get fired, or whatever, uh, that's going to cause strain. And then, of course, there's the presence of negative stimuli. Bad things in our life that we don't like. You know, maybe I get diagnosed with cancer. Maybe I, uh, my mother-in-law comes to live with us or, um, you know, uh, some negative thing is entering my life. Uh, the higher that these three things are, the more they happen, the more strain we have in our life, right? And everybody has some amount of strain. And some of us, uh, you know, what our positive stimuli and what our negative stimuli and what our goals are, that's all going to vary person to person to person, but we're all going to have some amount of strain. Um, but importantly, most of us 
have adequate coping skills, right? We deal with this strain in healthy ways. We listen to music, we punch a punching bag, we go for a jog, we uh, watch sad movies and cry a lot, you know, whatever. When you don't have those uh, adequate coping skills, that's when these strains turn to criminal behavior, right? So the more strains in our life and the less uh, adequate, healthy coping behaviors we have, the more likely we are to turn to crime to kind of address and deal with these strains uh, in an unhealthy way, right? Applied to cybercrime, there's not a lot of research except for cyberbullying. Okay, cyberbullying is the one crime that's seen uh, a decent amount of research when it comes to strain theory. Uh, and it seems to be associated, these kinds of um, uh, strains and lack of coping mechanisms seem to be as, uh, associated pretty, pretty well with both offending and victimization for cyberbullying, right? So um, whether these, uh, you know, removal of positive stimuli and presence of negative stimuli, whether all those strains are associated with things like... Um, you know, digital piracy or uh, e-commerce fraud or malware creation or whatever, we really don't know. There, there's not a lot of good research and not a good answer out there on that one yet. Uh, but when it comes to bullying, it not only seems to be uh, pretty decently correlated with offending behavior, but also victimization behavior. So if we can somehow um, increase the amount of healthy coping skills for uh, youth and um, uh, young people in general, we might be able to make a, a, a decent, um, uh, we might be able to reduce cyberbullying, offending and victimization um, if we can help people deal with their strains and stresses in a more healthy way. All right, we're gonna take a break. We'll be right back.